Dr. Avery mentioned, we are here to help offer CME credits through our Grand Rounds presentation. So we are partnering with the TAFP. Um, our mission statement is listed here for you. Um, as we begin, I believe the Zoom participants already have their microphones muted. And then all who are in attendance, if you could just please make sure that you are engaged in this session. And I will be at the very end, there's going to be a QR code for everybody. If you could help provide some feedback for us um, on our speaker today and the topic. So um, I'll also put that in the chat box for our viewers on Zoom. Um, so for those who do want to claim credit for this, um, attending this Grand Rounds, you'll want to make sure if you have not yet registered, you'll have to you'll have to do that first, but I'll go over that in just a moment. But those who have registered, um, this is the activity code for today. Um, you'll text ATTEND along with this code um, to the toll-free number listed here. Um, and you'll want to make sure you do that before midnight tonight so that can, you can claim credit. Um, so if you've not yet registered, you're going to want to make sure you send your email address to the toll-free number you see there. Um, and then again, after that, you will text ATTEND and the code for today listed in that box. You'll text it to that toll-free number and, and you should get credit. If you're having any issues with that, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll still be here uh, during the meeting, so please feel free um, to reach out to me, or um, for those who are on Zoom, you can send me a message. Um, if you are claiming credits, please make sure that you do check your CME transcript every so often to make sure that those credits are showing up. You can do that by visiting the CME office website, um, which you can see the website address here, or you can give them a call. I'm also happy to help as well. We also want to make sure that we do point out that this uh, presentation does provide credit through the AFP as well. So keep that in mind. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me um, or the AFP. We also want to make sure that we do mention that it is our goal during these Grand Rounds presentations to address the nationally established physician core competencies that you see listed here. And Dr. Sarfani has no financial rela relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. So I will let Dr. Avery go ahead and introduce her. So let me introduce you to our speaker for tonight. Um, she would be speaking on the most common foot and ankle overuse injuries seen in primary care setting. Dr. Shumay Letsarpani is a fellowship trained foot and ankle orthopedic specialist, a native of San Antonio. She received her bachelor's degree at Rice University in Houston, Texas. She then traveled to Rochester, Minnesota to complete her medical school training at the Mayo Clinic. After completing her orthopedic surgery residency in Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, she subspecialized in foot and ankle surgery at the Campbell Clinic in Memphis, Tennessee. She has re uh, received multiple awards, um, one of which are the Master Teacher Award at Vanderbilt University as well. So Dr. Sarpani has interest in foot and ankle and wide and, uh, are wide and it includes trauma, arthritis, total ankle replacement, sports-related injuries, deformity, and complex foot reconstruction. Um, help me welcome her today, uh, to this evening, um, Dr. Sharpani. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for having me uh, speak. Um, I am uh, with knee surgery. I specialize in foot ankle. Um, so when I was asked to speak, there was so many different topics that ran through my mind in terms of what we could possibly cover um, in the whole area of foot, you know, below knee uh, pathology. But I wanted to make I, I wanted to make sure that you know the lecture was uh, very clinically applicable um, to your practice and um, the most. And I try to keep it very relevant to the things that I felt would be most likely in the primary care setting and kind of just basic review of first line treatment options. Um, some of these, I'm sure you guys have all seen every single one of these pathologists come to your clinic. You uh, may or may not treat it exactly the same way, uh, but that's great for discussion. If you have any questions at all, uh, please feel free to ask me. Um, so uh, that's a little bit about myself, um, but you know, so 
went over that in the introduction. So I'm I'm from San Antonio. I moved back uh, recently. I'm with Work of San Antonio now. Um, these are my partners. In case you guys are familiar with other people in my group, uh, shameless advertising here. So I'm going to introduce these partners. Uh, and you know, if you're uh, you have. Jay, my counterpart, um, and we work together. And um, you know, if you forget me, I like stand out in the broad reasons. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So objectives. So first, um, I thought we, I picked. I there were so many things we could talk about. I picked four of things that I thought would be the most common things that I see all the time that I figured, uh, you know, usually get referred from primary care clinics or or, or could pre really present in your clinic. So we'll review the pathology exam and treatment of a few of these um, that I picked out. Um, I picked mostly overuse injuries. Um, ankle sprains are technically not overuse, they're trauma traumatic, but I figured that that was common enough that you see that it would be important to cover. Um, and we'll keep it pretty, you know, like first line treatment options, very applicable, different types of immobilization and indicate, and also when it's appropriate to send to orthopedics. So this is my first kind of takeaway point is, <laughs> We can always send to orthopedics. Um, you guys have the daunting task of being able to see anything that walks into your clinic. Um, so I, no orthopedic surgeon will ever, I have some, you know, primary care friends who say, well, we don't want to send that to orthopedics because that's not surgical. Uh, you guys, I wish I had a sort of like all surgical clinic. I, I don't, uh, only about 15 or 20% of my patients ever really need surgery. Um, most of the patients I see are non-operative care. Um, of foot and ankle pathology. Um, that's all I do. And so I welcome it. And it's totally fine if you see someone you want to send it over. I, I you know, I, that's fine. I don't I don't think any orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon will, will blink at that. These are things that we also see every day as first line in our clinic. So first to start off with uh, Achilles tendonitis. Um, so this is an inflammatory condition. Um, it can be, there are basically two types of Achilles tendonitis that you can get, insertional or non-insertional, depending on where it happens in the Achilles. The most common type of Achilles tendonitis is probably non-insertional, which happens three to four centimeters above the insertion of the calcaneus. Um, that's typically related to um, the fact that it's a vascular watershed area. Um, however, insertional tendonitis is also very, very common. Um, Calcification or spurring. Um, it, calcification can be a result of a long-standing disease, um, and sometimes people can get, um, you know, deposition of calcification at the insertion. Um, frequently, though, I hear people say, "I've got a spur," this, like the spur. They love talking about the spur. It freaks them out. The spur is not the cause of Achilles tendonitis, nor is it the cause of plantar fasciitis. So, if you're telling, you know, if you say like you have a spur and that spur needs to be addressed. That is uh, not uh, exactly correct. It's really a consequence of a tendinopathy rather than the cause of their issue. If I do surgery, I take the spur off. So people stop asking me about it, but that's not really. <laughs> so this is not really that critical to treating your pathology to be perfectly honest. Um, and so, yeah, so, and then finally, you know, it's usually, uh, typically, and you'll see a pattern uh, as we go through all of these, these overuse injuries. Overuse injuries are usually a, a problem of some sort of um, mechanical, like, biomechanical, it's a mechanical imbalance with some sort of, uh, like, either a tight hamstring or tight gastrocnemius, um, just generally a tight posterior cord that can cause excess tension on the heel cord. Um, typically, um, it's it's a lot of times as people, I always ask about recent activity. Um, have you picked up um, a new activity? Are you walking more? Are you training for a run? That's, you know, a frequent cul culprit. Um, did you start a new exercise program? There's, there's frequently a trigger, but even if there's not, it's just good to ask because it leads to the pathology of it. Inappropriate stretching and recovery, that's not a very, like, Sometimes, like patients, I, I I can see them, you know, raise like I get it. I know, I know, I'm supposed to stretch before and after, but nobody does. But they know that that's what they're supposed to do. But frequently, when there's an imbalance, and you know, you're not warm, you're not recovering appropriately afterwards, you can have this as pathology. And finally, a Hadwin's deformity can be associated with either retrocalcaneal bursitis or um, Achilles tendonitis. Um, the bottom picture is a representation of a Hadwin's. Um, 
still treat it the same way. I still treat it the same way. It's just the only thing I think if I see someone who's got that really prominent um, shape of their calcaneus that can predispose them to tendonitis is maybe may not be as responsive to non-operative treatment, but I always treat them non-operative first. They should always go through the first line treatment because really a majority of them get better and a responsible surgeon would always do no, you know, non-operative stuff. It's really exhausted before you do surgery. Um, as a part of the exam, this exam is fairly straightforward. Their, their pain will be right over where they have Achilles tendonitis. It's either right at the insertion, and you know, sometimes it's very surprising it's like right on the bone, but it's because that Achilles tendon has a very broad, like fan-like uh, insertion on the uh, calcaneus. Um, and so it'll be right on their calcaneus or a couple of a uh, few centimeters above. Um, you things to differentiate this from. So I kind of included as part of the exam or the pathology too, like other things you should be thinking about and things not to miss with these presentations. With Achilles, it's really like, could it be a retrocalcaneal bursitis? That exam will be a little different. It's not going to be tenderness directly on the Achilles. It will be more um, within their retrocalcaneal space, so a little bit deeper and with uh, like in their, um, you know, right behind their subtalar joint. Um, <clears throat> and obviously a rupture. So that a rupture is usually pretty obvious. They'll have a history. Usually people don't just rupture their tendon without a traumatic mechanism. <clears throat> with the exam, aside from, you know, palpating and looking at it, um, I think the other important thing to notice about this is how boggy their tendon is and the acuity of how long they've been having symptoms. So if, they've been, if they tell me that their symptoms are three to four weeks and they've got a ton of swelling and bogginess right uh, involving that Achilles tendon, that will help dictate how aggressive I am with their mobilization, their first line treatment. And if it's been going on for many years, they don't have a lot of bogginess where it kind of feels like squishy, you know, but it, it'll just be pain over the tendon. So, um, and then, you know, the silver stool. So you want to see how tight their hamstring is really. I just have them straighten their knee out and I see how far they can dorsal flex their foot. Usually most people can get to at least 90 or a little bit beyond 90 with their knee fully extended. And then it improves a little bit when you flex the knee because you take your gas work out of it. Um, but the point is you just see how tight their heel is. And particularly if they're like, I have Achilles tendonitis and you have them straighten their leg out and they can't even get to 90, you know that it's because they have a very, very tight posterior cord and that they can work on that. And that can be more responsive to PT. Um, so treatment. So my treatment algorithm, when you have that person who presents and their Achilles tendon is very foggy and it's an acute presentation, those are the ones that I'm immobilizing. I am not typically immobilizing these people who are three to four years out have, you know, fluctuating or uh, waxing waning symptoms. I kind of think with a boot, that is not, I, I really use a boot selectively for acute pathology and I don't use it for chronic pathology because that is not a sustainable treatment option for them to continuously do. It's like if they have an initial flare up, it's been three to four weeks, they have a lot of fogginess, that's when I am putting them in a boot to completely shut down their Achilles and I will put them on a regimented course of, um, you know, a steroid, either a medrol dose pack followed by some sort of anti-inflammatory uh, over two to three weeks, and I tell them to stop after that. And then I have, I see them back, and as long as they're improving, which they they usually always do, you can shut them down for a little bit. Then I advance to the next stage. Otherwise, for the mo for most people, that's not the stage they're presenting. They're really presenting with this chronic disease. There's just a few treatment options that I would recommend, but really most people do great with it and they respond very well to it. First, a mechanical offloading with a heel lift and a regular shoe. And so, and if you guys ever had any questions about like what heel lifts do you like to send, give people? I um, I don't ever, I rarely, rarely, rarely ever prescribe custom orthotics. I'm gonna get to that when we talk about plantar fasciitis. I have a lot of opinions, but they, there's also literature. Anyway, so, um, but anyway, so with Achilles tendonitis, you add a little bit of a quarter inch heel lift that just takes the, a little bit of tension off the Achilles. Um, and it can help kind of, it can kind of help physical therapy. So I really emphasize to people, to patients, therapy is first, second, third line treatment. Achilles tendonitis is very, very responsive to this. They really need to try that. Um, before I, if they come in still hurting, did you do your exercises? No. Well, then that's what I'm going to continue to tell you to keep doing. So I really tell them that they have to do it at least a six to eight week course of home exercises. If they don't respond, then I send them back. I say, now, okay, if you did home exercises, it's not helpful. Then we're going to do PT. Um, activity modification. Frequently, there's a some sort of 
event that happened. They are training for a marathon. They started a new job. They're logging way more steps than they normally do. Well, I mean, you can't change your job, but you can, you know, if you're running, I often have to have a long conversation with my runners. Y'all are good runners. It's kind of painful sometimes, but they, you know, it, you have to convince them that there is something going on with their training schedule that is not, their body is not able to match that or to give them that and anti-inflammatories. Uh, a note on PT, when I tell people that to do home exercises frequently, what I hear from people is, oh, um, I, I've just been like doing this with my like ankle up and down. Um, it's not really enough. Usually this is a, the Academy of Orthopedic Surgery has this really great patient resource. I actually have these printed out in my clinic. And so if, if I tell people there are two ways to do PT, you could do home PT or physical therapy. If you're gonna do home PT, you have to be very, very diligent about it. I'm gonna give you a packet. You guys, our fellows have heard this speech like a million times because I say it to every patient, but I tell them if I give you the exercises, you have to do them. So, you know, there's pictures and step-by-step -step instructions. And this is like a nine page complete foot and ankle conditioning program. So it's very, clear and outline for patients. And I highly recommend if you're going to help the patients do exercises at home, guide them with this like uh, therapy program that you can print out and give to them. So it's a little bit more than just a, you know, stretch your heel. Okay. So that's kind of like my first line treatment on Achilles tendonitis, things like that. Um, I didn't talk about injections and I should have mentioned that a little bit. Um, Achilles tendonitis is one thing that you should never, ever, ever do steroid injection around. It really causes thinning or weakening of the tendon. It can cause a rupture. That's a big deal. Now, there is some literature to support either whole blood or PRP injections. That, I'll have an individual conversation with the patient after they've gone through this first line treatment. So if you all see them in your clinic, you do all this, they see you back in six to eight weeks and they're still not responsive, that's when I, like, you know, you send them to either Dr. You know, Dr. Noche's an orthopedic provider. And then they, like, I will have a conversation with them about P, like, if you want to look at PRP, I'd probably get an MRI at that point. That's when I'm getting my MRI. I don't need an MRI for them, but anyway, something to consider. All right. Second uh, pathology, uh, not exactly overuse, but a, a common injury that you guys see ankle sprains all the time. So um, a little bit about the pathology. I think the most important thing with an ankle sprain is to make sure to differentiate whether it's a low or a high ankle sprain. So um, that is very clearly different on an exam. When I have someone who, who has a high ankle sprain, um, I can tell the difference on the exam. Um, and it is important because if you have a high ankle sprain, which I'm going to kind of explain what that means exactly. But if you, uh, I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but if you look at the you know, the right side of this image, you're right, but right side of this image. Um, a high ankle sprain is injuries to the AITFL, the anterior inferior tibial ligament. That is a part of the complex of ligaments that make up your symphysmosis, and your symphysmosis is a really, that's the point between the tibia and the fibula. The stability of that joint is critical. I mean, we have an entire ankle complex just talking about the synosmosis because it's fairly con controversial, it can be on treatment. But it's important to recognize that their pain is a little bit more proximal or they stay radiated up their leg. Um, there are uh, some dynamic actions that I usually get to make sure that it isn't, it doesn't dynamically widen um, versus getting something like a scan, preferably a weight bearing CT scan that can really look at that uh, relationship between the tibia and the fibula distally to make sure that that's not gapped open. Because if you treat that like a regular ankle sprain, first of all, it, it, it will not respond to an offer treatment. And second of all, a delay in that can result, um, it can result in, uh, you know, further instability of the ankle joint. They can have acute injuries that lead to osteochondral lesions of the calyx from harder to treat. And in the long term, if that goes this, it results in deep arthritis, which is not good. So that's just kind of one note on that. A low ankle sprain here. So this is going to be 90% of your ankle sprains are just run of just normal and anterior ankle sprains. When you palpate for that ankle sprain injury, that that results in injuries that extend all the anterior fibular, not the anterior inferior tibial fibular. 
ATFL is different. That's the one that's the most commonly affected in an ankle sprain. That and the CFL, which is not in this picture of the CFL and the ATFL. You can differentiate this by the history frequently. So this is a good example of um, neck pains. So typically when people have, when most patients will present to you with an ankle sprain, it'll be some sort of inversion mechanism. I'll tell you know, they say, I turn my ankle in, they invert their ankle. That is, a, you know, the, I fell off a curb, I, you know, whatever, that's very common. And that causes internal rotation, it causes you to stretch that ATF on tear it. So they're gonna be more tender distally and just anterior to the tip of the fibula. That's where they're gonna be painful. If they're painful way, like a couple centimeters more proximal to that, like in the more in the anterior ankle, then you should probably suspect a syndesmotic injury, AKA a high ankle sprain. And that's something that should probably be evaluated further with dynamic uh, pressures. Uh, not that they all need surgery, but you should look at the instability, how it's unstable they are to make sure they don't accumulate surgery. Um, so mechanism can be helpful, like I talked about inversion versus eversion. The mechanism of injury for a high ankle sprain will be, um, a lot of times it's an external rotation uh, injury of their ankle. Um, so the foot kind of outwardly turns and then that can really press the foot and the talus against the fibula, which will widen at the tibia yeah. fibular space. Um, so just something to think about and dis uh, distinguish, low ATFL and plastic exam. So um, treatment for your regular low ankle sprain. First, boot immobilization. I, I do put my ankle sprains in boots for two weeks only. I do not immobilize them for six weeks at a time. Um, I really just immobilize them for two weeks. I tell them that typically when the biggest risk uh, that I'm trying to prevent with a two-week initial immobilization is that's when you have just torn your ligaments, your ankle is the most unstable right now, and that's the time that re-injury, uh, re-spraining the ankle is most likely. So putting someone in a boot for immobilization can help just calm down. I feel like people do not want to do, you know, physical therapy two weeks into a bad ankle sprain. And these severe ankle sprains, they look horrible. I mean, they are hugely swollen. They got bruising all down their ankle. And you know, when I tell them your x-rays are okay, oh, you should always do x-rays. That's from one piece of view. So obviously I'm gonna say that literally for every single situation, you should always get x-rays, but um, you should always get x-rays because it's really hard to distinguish if that's gonna be, you know, a fracture or not. But sometimes patients have a hard time believing that their ankle is not broken. And I really have to tell them my seat, which is a bad ankle sprain takes, is a big deal and it takes a long time to get that to, to get better from. So lay a lot of great patients, make sure they understand that it's not something that'll feel better in four or even six weeks. Um, there are studies that show that at three months, so 60% of patients um, are asymptomatic, but a good minority of them still have symptoms. And then that goes down to about 10, 10% at about six months. Um, but it just tells you that it really takes a few months before they feel uh, just like totally normal. And that really helps kind of set expectations, which I, I spend a lot of time on. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, this is a little bit uh, kind of what I was talking about. AITFL is, you know, it's, uh, it will be more proximal and their tendons really does radiate to the AITFL versus the ACFL and CFL, which are going to be more distal and directly lateral over the ankle. Um, if the exam is not classic, low threshold ascend and dynamic, uh, you know. Those can be operative, important to identify, and or they're not operative, and they really do need to be immobilized for longer. So I started talking about this already. So boot immobilization. So this is, um, you know, based on your clinic. I, I, we only stock. I only stock, stock tall walking boots in my clinic. I, I don't usually have a short walking boot. I think if you're going to immobilize the ankle, you need to immobilize the length of the lower leg to really control the rotational forces across the ankle. But, um, you know, I feel more strongly about that for certain injuries than others. Um, ankle sprains are somewhere in between. So if you only stop short walking boots, I mean, at least that's that's better. That's fine. Um, after two to three weeks, what I do is I transition them to a good supportive shoe. So I tell them that they need to wear a sneaker, that they can uh, start wearing a lace-up ankle brace. Um, so I would give them a good lace-up ankle brace, um, ASOs. And then 
The follow-up here is optional depending on the severity of the sprain. So I kind of determine my follow-up depending on how severe the sprain is. Um, sometimes that can mask other injuries. So sometimes I'll have them come in a bit sooner to make sure that it, it weren't, I'm not missing anything else. And at that point, when they're about two to three weeks out, I really give them the same exact option that I do, um, you know, for my Achilles tendonitis. I say you have two options, but you have to, I really recommend that you pick one of them. It's two forms of physical therapy. Either I give you a home therapy program, I'll give you the packet of information. You have to do the exercises, um, all of them through the packet. Um, or you send them to formal PT. And sometimes, I mean, y'all know, like y'all know when you're like, ah, that patient is not going to be able to do it. Like I, they really need to just go to a physical therapist. Um, but there's a lot of studies that early functional rehab and not prolonged immobilization for like six to eight week period of time, early functional rehab, even for those bad ankle sprains is very important and makes a difference for their recovery, speed of their recovery. I always advise patients that 90 to 95% of patients get better without treatment. Uh, like I told you, 60% of patients uh, have some residual uh, symptoms of three months, but the take home point is they take a long time to get better from. All right, next one, plantar fasciitis. So y'all see this all the time, I'm sure, because I see it all the time too. Um, but this is uh, basically fibrosis. Uh, it's a fibro fatty tissue. Uh, that is a result of long-standing tendinopathy of the plantar fascia, which is that thick band of tissue in the bottom of your foot that inserts onto the Achilles. Uh, just again, heel spurs do not cause plantar fasciitis. I, they always point out their heel spur, and I say, all right, 50% of people who have plantar fasciitis have heel spurs. 50% of people who do not have plantar fasciitis have heel spurs. So there is no correlation between that, and we do not need to address, like, if you would do these things, just don't worry about heel spur. Differential. So there are different things that can cause plantar heel pain. So plantar heel pain does not always mean plantar fasciitis. It usually means that. So you can kind of, you know, comment, and comment. But I think you should still have in your head a couple of different uh, things on your differential diagnoses for what plantar heel pain can manifest as. First, carceral tunnel. They will talk about plantar heel pain, but they will also have some radiating symptoms. Uh, through the plantar aspect of their foot. Um, subcalcaneal bursitis. So this is different than plantar fasciitis um, because it does change my management a little bit. If I feel like they're tender, not right at the insertion. So I actually, this is just like a stop in it, but I liked it because it actually shows you exactly the two different spots to differentiate plantar fasciitis between subcalcaneal first picture. You can have fat pad postural inflammation that is different than tendinitis of the plantar fascia. And that really will, they will actually be very specific about where it's bothering them. Uh, on the right side, this is where the medial band is usually on the central band of the plantar fascia that is really gets tendinitis. So you'll notice that when you palpate, it's usually slightly medial to central, um, uh, uh, right in front of the fat pad itself. If they have a subcalcaneal portion of the picture, it will really be right under the heel pad itself. I mean, the fat part of the heel pad is not just different, and they will also describe it a little bit differently. Sometimes those subcalcaneal portion of patients will say it feels like I'm walking on a knee, or they'll say I have a up shoulders. That's something that I feel like really makes the stripe on my subcalcaneal portion of the patient versus. Uh, um, plantar fasciitis. Kind of why is that important to differentiate? Because it, 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 I offer them treatment a little bit differently, and I'll get to um, that's with neuritis. So sometimes we talk to you know, plantar fasciitis is not response for some treatment. Maybe we just have an intention of uh, a brain to allow a healthy nerve, which is the which is back to the neuritis. Okay. Um, so let's go to So, first line treatment. I have this printed out on a pamphlet. I, I sit down with a patient and I go through every single one of these things. And I tell them that this is all of my first line treatment and I have fasciitis. And the majority of patients come back and really have a response. And if they don't, then I talk about others, uh, you know, what happens if they fail. Um, and I'll try to go through each of these, okay? So, nowhere is a frequent culprit to plantar fasciitis. 
um, it is is really, really, really responsive to just changing shoewear. Um, I have I give them my shoewear recommendations, which I'll share with you guys. Um, there are some shoes that I really dislike universally, and there are some shoes that I really like, but it's not really because, you know, it, it really has to do with the way the shoe is made and the support of the shoe. Um, a couple of the family members, since I'm sure, have heard because I can talk to you guys. Anyway, so um, you guys know my how passionate I am about shoes. Uh, so, uh, right about the um, but your support shoes all time and avoid walking barefoot. So I would tell them, you need to keep your shoes right by the foot of your bed and then wear those when you walk around. Really try wearing them all the time. Not forever, but the first six weeks I want to do that. Um, PT, PT, PT. When you change the kind of the, the length of the posterior cord, it changes uh, where you step on your foot uh, and it can sometimes offload. Uh, that kind of fascia, if you have, uh, if you have flexibility in your filter. So I give them the same exact home therapy program. I, I offer, do the same speech, offer them the PT, either formally or at home, if you do at home, go through your exercises. I don't go through the camera, I just hear the exercises that you have to go through, you have to go through that. Daily icing, so part of this, I say a mechanical treatment with those sort of shoes, it's kind of like a splint for your foot to help bring your blood flow, to help, you know, change the um, biomechanics of how you're loading your foot. And I call that this another part of this decreases the inflammatory component of this. And daily ice, you may see 20 minutes of half of ice on the bottom of your foot every single time. Night splinting, so night splinting just to bring foot force stress. Um, that is really, there are a whole variety of night splints out there, and some patients, uh, just all of them. But uh, I think that there are some that are like, Better tolerated than others, um, and I'll show you guys that in this. Um, so if they had say their first pain and their first step in the morning is people, then I would have to be nice. Um, and I'm going to go south. I don't know if you can. A medical dose stuff would make them feel amazing for about two weeks, and then I and I tell them that I say, you're going to feel great for two weeks, but if you don't do all of this other stuff, it does not matter. It will come back and it will hurt. But this is to make you not you know, miserable right now, and it's for, to allow you to start doing the PC and the other stuff that you have to do. I tell them, you know, kind of fresh eyes is miserable because it takes a lot of TLC and a lot of little things to do the basis that can add up to making a big difference. Um, tennis ball, I saw the ball massage, you all know that. I know we have a lot of patients who are doing these. Um, you know, they're like, I love to jog or walk five miles a day, and I call that not that I would do right now, I would really wait until it's consistently better. Um, do lower end craft activities, stationary bike, a elliptical, or a machine, things like that. That's not constant. Um, from the bottom of the foot. The other thing I tell people is note that in my first line of treatment, I do not have two things that are usually first that are frequently in the lower percentage. I I do not have steroids mentioned in there, and I do not have custom robotics mentioned in there. There are, um, we'll kind of talk about that. Um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of talk about that. Um, if they do all this, they come back. The majority of patients get a lot better. Um, you know, this it's waxes and way you see. She may have some flare ups. You have to redo all of this. That's for uh, adequate reason. If they do not feel good at that time, that's why I probably will get an MRI just to be sure I'm not missing. Um, and then that's when I talk to them about a possible injection, but not. Steroid, not doing The only time that I do think about steroid is if I truly really believe they have a subcapnial bursa rather than plantar fasciitis. And I will have, um, actually, I'll grab a drug in which they can do it under workers' own guidance. And you can find if they truly can actually, honestly, on your exam, you can build a bursal sac for those patients that truly have that. And my threshold will be lower. I already have my exam. I'll still have them do all of this stuff first. But I tell them that my threshold to offer you an injection um, is lower, and I do offer steroid, but not into the plantar fascia or around the plantar fascia. I do it directly into um, the first sac, which you can. If you're looking for it, you'll want it. Um, but you have to go to, to, to do that as part of your exam. 
And that's the only time I'll do that. I, I really don't offer steroid injections into the plan of action. I think that there is a, first of all, um, I feel like the effects are temporary. I feel like it's a lot like a mental dose pack. Um, secondly, um, there is a real risk of doing the plantar fascia causing a rupture, and I have seen a couple of those in my clinic for patients who were treated with steroid injections and then and they felt a tear in their heel, and now they feel swollen bruised. It's because they ruptured their plantar fascia. That's a very difficult problem when that happens. There is no surgery. I cannot do. I call. I cannot do surgery on you to make this better. Um, there is no surgery. It's just you have modification. Um, over the counter, good quality orthotics and time. Um, so um, for planning fascia, so when they come back, if they're not better, I'm getting them all right. I talked about a PRP injection because I think there's better data out there now about PRP versus steroid um, on longer term outcomes uh, and actually regenerative properties of PRP. Uh, still controversial, um, but, but yes. And then plus or minus a power step orthotics. So there are also good studies out there that show that custom orthotics that cost a patient hundreds of dollars do not make it. Like, I always ask patients, yo, you got custom orthotics. Did it help you? Universally, they're like, that's like always the response. It's always kind of like mediocre. It kind of helps a little bit, I guess. But for honestly, a good quality over the counter orthotic, which I, I like power steps. I think power steps are great. You get them on Amazon. Um, they're thirty-five dollars instead of like three hundred and fifty dollars, and they honestly do okay. Actually, they do better. I think my patients have power sets better. Um, I don't think they're worse than custom orthotics. And the worst thing is they're out thirty-five bucks instead of three hundred. So when I ask you, feels like that level, like perfect choice. The medial side of the ankle or the foot? Like um, no, it doesn't. If the exam's pretty classic where it's always like have that medial band, it's always a little bit medial. It's always kind of in the arch. Um, sometimes I'll diagnose people with like atypical plantar fasciitis. If it's more, if you're talking about like more like arch or mid arch pain, that's a little different because plantar. Um, it's atypical, but I would still do the first line treatment. I would still do all of this. And then maybe I'd have a lower threshold if they came back and not get better to get an MRI. Because maybe that's more like if it's more tender over the tarsal tunnel, things like that. Um, and I, I can think of one patient who was like that, where I was like, it's kind of, it's a little bit too medial. It's not really, it's more where the tarsal tunnel would be or like Baxter's nerve impingement. Um, so I'd be more likely to think about that, but I'd still do all of this treatment first. Um, a power support, I think we're talking about surgery, you know, with any parts of plantar flash release, but really my speech to patients about surgery is I would really try to avoid the surgery. It's, I tell them it's a 70, 70 surgery. And what I mean by that is 70% patients get 70% better. And typically if I'm doing surgery, my, I'm offering you odds that are way better than that, not 70%. So, I, you know, most people, I I see this a lot and I operate on it very little. Um, okay, so shoes. I have some favorite shoes. Um, my favorite shoes are Pokas. I don't know why I'm offering my parents on this. Um, I, there's one brand of shoes that I really hate, university. I hope nobody, you know, I don't know I'm not talking about the brands, but like I really don't want to I do not like sketchers. I, I really don't like them. I tell them, you got sketchers, you got to get rid of your sketchers. Um, I really like Pocus. I think they have a lot of rigidity in the outer sole. And I and I really, but honestly, I should. I do not have any financial disorders. I should. But I really should take this. I don't. I really love Pocus. It's not just any more people with financial surgeons. They, I don't even, accept, like, even my diabetics, I don't even tell them to get that diabetic shoes. I tell them to get Pocus. So. Uh, that's like something to be done, but you know, for the most part, most people I think just focus on the fact that, and some people don't want to be able to do it. If that's the case, then I tell them, like, Brooks is my second favorite, and I really like Brooks too. And really, what I do is I take my focus off in clinic and I show the patient this is the quality of the shoe that you need to be looking at, whether you get a hook or not. If you take a shoe and if you can tie it in a knot, so if you can bend that shoe. 
that that is not supportive enough for most of the naval pathology. Most of the naval pathology responds very well to rigidity in a shoe. Having a rigid outer sole of the shoe is a good quality, good support for um, to the glaze and people feet because I get my patients discount for design because these shoes aren't um, and uh, that's kind of a resource that I use. Uh, that's an example of a nice one. So if you don't carry it in your clinic, I have an example of what you carry in life because very similar, right? You really need to be the most well tolerated um, as like what it kind of looks like. Um, I again note the absence of customer orthotics or steroids. Um, I kind of talked about that in plantar fascia rupture. Oh, and then this is a picture of power steps. So uh, again, it's 30 bucks on the next one. Um, and I think that if you wanted to add that, that's a good thing. Also, sometimes uh, I do on the first time I see it, sometimes I don't. Just depends on the patient. I, I said I reasonable expectations that most get better without surgery, but I tell them this can take months to burn out. And then when you see me back in six weeks, I don't expect you to be 100%, but I expect you to be a lot better. And if you're not, then we need to do more. And I tell them surgery is not a slam dunk. So, um, yes. They can't what? Can they play Saturday night? Oh, like if they're in a sport? I tell them, you can look, you can do whatever you want. It's going to hurt. So I, that's what I tell them. They're like, well, okay, but I have a race coming up. I'm like, okay, run your race. You're going to be miserable. Uh, and then you do all these things. So you know what you have to do to get better, whether you do it or not. Like, I mean, that's, you know, I tell them, like, you can do it. It's going to hurt. I tell them, like, look, I mean, this isn't like, I tell them, this is not heart attack or cancer. You can live with this. You're not going to die from it. So if you don't do it, you're just going to hurt. If you do it, then maybe you'll feel better. Um, <laughs> Well, into my clinic. Okay, so uh, so a couple of uh, I did do a couple of studies, um, and I kind of summarized like the main takeaway point. I wish uh, Jasper was uh, covering the main title uh, titles of these, but basically, um, this is uh, it's basically corticosteroid on the left side. It's corticosteroid injections uh, for plantar fasciitis. It was a systematic review and a meta analysis. Um, that was done relatively recently in 2018, and they compared steroid injections to placebo. They have short, medium, and long-term follow-ups, and they did different sort of uh, different uh, PROs at, at each time. And they said, you know, steroid injections are fairly short-lived, and it can increase the rate of plantar fascia rupture, and that in the long term it was equivalent to a placebo injection. This is a 2020 study um, that uh, was a uh, uh, systematic review of uh, RCTs of PRP versus steroid for plantar fasciitis. And that at each uh, short, medium, long-term follow-up, the PRP consistently did better in outcome scores, and that those effects held up even in long-term um, uh, patient-reported outcomes than uh, uh, steroid injections. Here's the biggest drawback. It is not covered by insurance. So the injection costs like $500 or dollars which is a barrier for people. Like some people are like, well, I can't, I can't do that. So I tell them, um, you know, then we have to have a, a different conversation about where we go if they, if I truly believe that they have exhausted treatment options. Um, and if they haven't done formal PT, I really do encourage them to do formal PT. If they're like, I did home PT and I'm still not better, then you should try a round of formal PT. Okay, last thing, posterior tibial insufficiency. So this is something that's very common um, and the exam is very classic. It's usually when it's usually women who are between forty to sixty year old, years old. Um, it's um, relatively common, and it's in uh, tendonitis or inflammation of the posterior tibial tendon uh, and sheath. And it's usually in a very typical location, uh, right behind the medial mouth. Posterior tip actually runs very close to the medial mouth. So if you feel the medial mouth and you fall just off the back of it, they will consistently tell you it's right over course of it and then you get to the navicular and then they, it stops there because the, uh, you know you'll know the posterior tibial tendon attaches to the navicular so they will always say it stops there no pain anywhere else this may or may not be associated with an adult acquired collapsing arch or an adult flat deformity there are many adult flat foot deformity is is very complex that is not the only cause of an adult flat foot but it is part of the pathology of it and so sometimes these people can have different stages. Stage one is not associated with a flat foot deformity. Um, it's a normal foot, neutral hind foot, neutral arch, but they're tender and bogged right over the posterior tendon without pain elsewhere. 
as the course of the disease progresses you, um, and it doesn't get, you know, if it doesn't get treated or if it's bad, they can get to stage two or stage three where they do start collapsing because the posterior tibial tendon is an arch stabilizer and plantar flexor. So it, it, I tell them it's the main thing that keeps your arch, it's one of the things that keeps your arch stabilized. So as the disease progresses, these patients can have a collapsed arch. Um, and sometimes as the arch collapses, their hind foot will come into balance. So they'll have subfibular impingement type pain and get lateral side of pain. But that's more of a downstream effect. Anyway, um, let's kind of talk about the exam. So the exam is very classic. It's tender, right over the course of the TV, never down in the way um, They get their weeks, the way she tried to go on their foot. We can't. And when we do an exam from uh, a man from, uh, uh, from behind through the back of the field, we'll see this person's ankle is uh, clearly in balance. They've got external rotation in their midfoot as a consequence of um, not being, being insufficient. And from the back of their foot, you can kind of see their less supposed to peak out because it has that external rotation deformity that uh, develops. Uh, with posterior tibial tendonitis, and that's called like a, a too many toe sign. So, too many toe sign, because it's a bill race, a tender of the course of posterior tibial tendon, uh, very, very classic. Um, and then, you know, sometimes they can have secondary effects, like I talked about treatment. So, a lot of times these patients actually are more likely than Achilles tendonitis or plantar fasciitis to come in sooner um, because it's not, you know, traumatically associated and people are more familiar with plantar fasciitis, stay way longer, or Achilles tendonitis. When people have this medial ankle pain, they come in sooner. And typically when they come in sooner, when they come in sooner that's why, uh, again, like same pattern, same philosophy, boot immobilization for acute pathology. I don't put them in a boot if they're like, I've had this for, you know, three years, it comes and goes. So I put them in a boot if they uh, like have a shorter than six week long presentation. Um, it just started a few weeks ago, whatever. I do so I do shutting them down in a boot, stay them with a course standard four weeks early can be very helpful. And then after that, or if they're more chronic in nature, I go over I, I do these first line treatment options. Sure, not the patient. Um, I do for these patients. I do put them in a power step every single time, but it's not because the it's not just because of the power step. Yes, the power step helps uh, give them a little bit of arch support. That arch support takes the tension off the posterior tip because their hind foot's not in balance as much if you can stabilize the arch. But uh, what I do is I actually modify it with a uh, medial post. So I'll just. I mean, it's just like a felt pad that I know where to put it, and that helps tilt their uh, hind foot out of pelvis. And that little adjustment too can just help take some of that tendon to tension off of that posterior tip when they're looking at it. Uh, lace up ankle brace. Uh, so I do this ankle brace with the power set in a boca and daily IC and physical therapy, which is really can be very responsive to the team, um, but not if they're in the acute phase. If they're not responsive to that, then I'm really not getting an MRI. That's when I'm thinking about a custom brace, like a rich brace, which helps stabilize the subcular in the hind foot. Or I talk to them about surgery, and that's a, I mean, there's all sorts of surgical, you know, treatment options for that. I wanted to very briefly go over the different types of immobilization when it's appropriate. Options, post-op, sandwich, shoe, walking boot versus thundercast. Those are the options. This is how I determine how to immobilize people because um, you do not need to, like, if, if, the, if the injury is basically from the middle of the metaphorsis to the soul, you do not need to put them in a boot. So even if someone has a metaphorsis knife fracture, if they have toe fractures, I, I, I see them all the time in boots, you do not have to do this. You'd like to do this. I mean, just put them in the angle, and that means they're able to use so they don't get stiff in the angle. Um, I think if it's anything in the mid or the hind foot, then I would um, use a walking boot. And I, I've talked already about tall. The last thing is if you have acute trauma or deformity, or if you are suspecting something like, um, you know, a, a, an Achilles rupture, they should be splinted. Achilles rupture should be always splinted in plantar flexion, always. I, 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 you know, you, I would not send them out in a just a like, just walking boot because you really take away. Like he will really will suffer from the blood pressure since it's been hurt. Okay, so, um, uh, so if you're going to splint people, I, I say, um, 
Splinting is a responsibility to also lightly. If you do not splint people correctly, pressure sores, ulcers um, are a big, big, big deal. If they're bad, they're hard to take care of. Um, and um, just be careful if you are going to do it appropriately. All right, that's it. Um, do you guys have any questions or comments?
Yes. Oh, well, that's a great question. Well, that's a good question. I think there's not. So I think the idea is that it helps simulate vascular growth factors into the tendon to help uh, more like healing rather than steroid, which just decreases the inflammatory response. Um, I don't know, I can tell you that was more than that. And I know the options for these, but I think that that's the idea is that it brings in more like vascular growth factors that can help promote healing. Yes. One more question. Yes. Related to the silver point. The silver Yes. It's going to listen. Whatever you do, just put it in. Okay. Um, yeah, it's going to take a while to get better than that. Yeah. Well, you know, he's got like the resources of every elite facility in the world. As I tell my patients, they give me those examples sometimes, like they get Achilles ruptures and I treat them, you know, they get surgery for it, they're six months out, they're like, I'm not playing basketball yet. And well, Kevin Durant took nine months and he had like every single resource at his fingertips. So you are not going to be playing basketball anytime soon. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarfani, for a very informative talk. Definitely, these are things that we can use as um, uh, primary care physicians. We see them a lot in our clinics, and we can advise them before we refer them to you. <laughs> um, uh, yes. So, um, I don't think that we have any um, questions in the chat. Um, so our next uh, step on uh, our agenda is for reports from our officers. I don't think there are any. Doctor is he? So so um, the next would be our. Oh yes, we do have. Yes, <laughs> Doctor Netfield, please. Well, um, inform our members of our new um website. We will include that in our next, when we leave, uh, send the our meeting invite, we will include that website in there so that you know where to go to for that, so. And please don't forget to evaluate our speakers today. Use this um, your code for that, so um, that's very important. Um, our next meeting will be on February 28th, I believe. It will be with Dr. Buzzledu, and the topic would be on diabetes. Um, if, so the meeting is, if there's no other um, important messages, I can't remember if there's anything else that I have to report. Um, well, I announced this meeting to be adjourned. Um, I would ask our officers to remain um, so that we can just discuss a few things. Thank you so much and good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here today.